Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and I got a very special guest with me today, Mr. Thomas Balsarski. And we're here live in the Princeton Cemetery, and we're actually at John Witherspoon's gravesite, and Samuel Stanhope Smith is only a couple down from him. And the reason that we're standing here is because these guys have John Breckenridge ties. And of course, Mr. Balsarski here, he has Breckenridge ties because of the James Buchanan connection. This is now the second vice presidential video where Thomas is making a guest appearance. Unbelievable. You're becoming a regular, Thomas. I can't believe it myself. <laughs> so we had, of course, William Rufus King, where Thomas, with his wonderful book about King and Buchanan, he came on and interviewed. And now this week we have John C. Breckenridge, and he was James Buchanan's vice president. So again, the whole tie-in, it's wonderful. So our next vice presidential series installment, looking at the 14th vice president of the United States, John C. Breckinridge, and this is Dead History. Hey guys, TJ back with you. Yep, here at the Princeton Cemetery with Dr. Thomas Balsersky, and we're going to be talking about the 14th Vice President of the United States. Who is that, Thomas? John Cavill Breckenridge. That's right, John Cavill Breckenridge. And we got some really cool things to tell you about John Breckenridge. Well, maybe not so cool. He was actually a traitor. Yeah, he went over to the Confederacy side and he actually fought for the Confederacy in the Civil War. And he was expelled from the Senate, right, Thomas? Four years under James Buchanan will do that to you. <laughs> there you go, exactly. Four years under James Buchanan kind of, I guess, makes you do some crazy things. So we're going to get into all that about Breckenridge. And of course, we're going to tell you about the ties with John Witherspoon and Samuel Stanhope Smith. They were actually his great grandfather and his grandfather. We're going to get into all that. So hopefully you did the likes and the subscribes. You're doing all that, hit that subscribe button down there. Leave the comments and questions. Love the comments and questions. Leave some questions for Thomas. I'm sure he'd be happy to answer some things for you. And of course, hit that little notification bell so you can be notified when we do release a new video, which if Henry was here, he would tell you that's every single week. And then if Henry was here, he would also tell you, go get the popcorn, go get the potato chips, go get whatever you want to snack on, because now we're gonna get into, in our next Vice Presidential Series installment, the 14th Vice President of the United States with my very special guest here, Thomas Balsersky. John C. Breckenridge is who we're gonna get into. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hey guys, welcome. TJ here with Dead History, and welcome to our next Vice Presidential Series installment as we take a look at the 14th Vice President of the United States, John Cabell Breckenridge. Uh, I am flying solo uh, for this uh, series. Uh, Henry's not with me this week. Uh, so uh, it is just me solo in the uh, video and for the audio. Uh, but a lot of cool things to tell you about John Breckenridge. Um, and we're going to get right into it. We're just going to hop right in uh, and start off. Of course, part one here, we're going to talk about the early life. Uh, political rise, you know, family, that sort of stuff. And then, of course, we're going to get all the way up to his vice presidency, and that will be in part two, of course. So here we go. Next vice presidential series installment, the 14th vice president of the United States, John Cabell Breckinridge. The only vice president ever to take up arms against the government of the United States John Cabell Breckinridge completed four years as vice president under James Buchanan, ran for president as the Southern Democratic candidate in 1860, and then returned to the Senate to lead the remnants of the Democratic Party for the first congressional session during the Civil War. Although his cousin Mary Todd Lincoln resided in the White House and his home state of Kentucky remained in the Union, Breckinridge chose to volunteer his services to the Confederate Army. The United States Senate formally expelled him as a traitor. When the Confederates were defeated, Breckinridge's personal succession forced him into exile abroad, bringing him bringing his promising political career 
to a bitter end. An illustrious political family. Born at Cabell's Dale, the Breckenridge family estate near Lexington, Kentucky on January 16th of 1821, John Cabell Breckenridge was named for his father and grandfather. The father, Joseph Cabell Breckenridge, a rising young politician, died at the state capitol at the age of 35. Left without resources, his wife took her children back to Cabell's Dale to live with their grandmother, known affectionately as Grandma Black Cap. She often regaled the children with stories of their grandfather, the first John Breckenridge, who, in addition to introducing the Kentucky resolutions that denounced the Alien and Sedition Acts, had helped secure the Louisiana Purchase and had served during the administration of Thomas Jefferson first as a Senate leader and then as Attorney General. The grandfather might well have become president one day, but, like his son, he died prematurely. The sense of family mission that his grandmother imparted shaped young John C. Breckinridge's self-image and directed him towards a life in public office. The family also believed strongly in education, since Breckinridge's maternal grandfather, Samuel Stanhope Smith, had served as president of the College of New Jersey at Princeton, and his uncle, Robert J. Breckinridge, started Kentucky's public school system. The boy attended the Presbyterian Center College in Danville, Kentucky, where he received his bachelor's degree at 17. He then attended Princeton before returning to Lexington to study law at Transylvania University. A tall, strikingly handsome young man with a genial air and a powerful voice, considered by many a perfect gentleman, Breckenridge set out to make his fortune on the frontier. In 1841, he and his law partner, Thomas W. Bullock, settled in the Mississippi River town of Burlingame in the Iowa Territory. There, he might have entered politics and pursued a career relatively free from the divisive issue of slavery. But Iowa's fierce winter gave him influenza and made him homesick for Kentucky. When he returned home on a visit in 1843, he met and soon married Mary Cyrene Birch of Georgetown. The newlyweds settled in Georgetown and Breckenridge opened a law office in Lexington. A Rapid Political Rise When the Mexican War began, Breckenridge volunteered to serve as an officer in a Kentucky Infantry re Regiment. In Mexico, Major Breckenridge won the support of his troops for his acts of kindness, being known to give up his horse to sick and foot-sore soldiers. After six months in Mexico City, he returned to Kentucky and to an almost inevitable political career. In 1849, while still only 28 years old, he won a seat in the State House of Representatives. In that election, as in all his campaigns, he demonstrated both an exceptional ability as a stump speaker and a politician's memory for names and faces. Shortly after the election, he met for the first time the Illinois legislator who had married his cousin Mary Todd. Abraham Lincoln, while visiting his wife's family in Lexington, paid courtesy calls on the city's lawyers. Lincoln and Breckinridge became friends, despite their differences in party and ideology. Breckinridge was a Jacksonian Democrat in a state that Senator Henry Clay had made a Whig bastion. In 1851, Breckinridge shocked the Whig party by winning the congressional race in Clay's home district, a victory that also brought him to the attention of national Democratic leaders. He arrived in Congress shortly after the passage of Clay's Compromise of 1850, which had sought 
to settle the issue of slavery in the territories. Breckinridge became a spokesman for the pro-slavery Democrats, arguing that the federal government had no right to interfere with slavery anywhere, either in the District of Columbia or in any other of the territories. Since Breckinridge defended both the Union and slavery, people viewed him as a moderate. The Pennsylvania newspaper paper publisher and political adventurer John W. Forney insisted that when Breckinridge came to Congress, he was in no sense an extremist. Forney recalled how the young Breckinridge spoke with great respect about Texas Senator Sam Houston, who denounced the dangers and evils of slavery. But Forney thought that Breckinridge was too interesting a character to be neglected by the able ultras of the South. They saw in his winning manners, attractive appearance, and rare talent for public affairs exactly the elements they needed in their concealed designs against the country. People noted that his uncle, Robert Breckinridge, was a prominent anti-slavery man, and that as a state legislator, Breckinridge had aided the Kentucky Colonization Society, a branch of the American Colonization Society dedicated to gradual emancipation and the resettlement of free blacks outside the United States. They suspected that he held private concerns about the morality of slavery and that he supported gradual emancipation. Yet, while Breckinridge was no planter or large slaveholder, he owned a few household slaves and ide idealized the Southern way of life. Idealized. He willingly defended slavery and white supremacy against all critics. So there you go. He may have had some mixed views or feelings uh, on slavery, but he did own some slaves, household servants and slaves himself. Uh, and he defended slavery anytime it came up and there was ever any big critic against slavery that was anti-slavery. He defended it uh, as being very pro-slavery. So, uh, interesting stuff. So I must say, Breckenridge really is a very, very interesting guy. Um, obviously, as I read at the beginning here, the only, the first and only uh, vice president to ever take up arms against the United States government and against the United States, obviously joining the Confederacy, after his vice presidency, um, just really just kind of an interesting person. So uh, really looking forward to diving in deeper here uh, to uh, Breckenridge. Now we're going to touch on the uh, the Kansas-Nebraska controversy and Breckenridge uh, revolving and regarding that. The Kansas-Nebraska controversy. In Congress... John Breckinridge became an ally of Illinois Senator Stephen A. Douglas. When Douglas introduced the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, which repealed the Missouri Compromise and left the issue of slavery in the territories to the settlers themselves, a policy known as popular sovereignty, Breckinridge worked hard to enact the legislation. Going to the White House, he served as a broker between Douglas and President Franklin Pierce, persuading the president to support the bill. He also spoke out in the House in favor of leaving the settlers free to form their own institutions and enter the Union with or without slavery as their constitutions should prescribe. During those debates in March of 1854, the normally even-tempered Breckinridge exchanged angry words on the House floor with Democratic Representative Francis B. Cutting of New York, almost provoking a duel. They were a high-strung pair, commented Breckinridge's friend Forney. Cutting accused Breckinridge of ingratitude toward the North, 
where he had raised campaign funds for his tough re-election campaign in 1853. Breckenridge, his eyes flashing fire, interrupted cutting speech, denied his charges, denounced his language, and demanded an apology. When Cutting refused, Breckenridge interpreted this as a challenge to a duel. He proposed that they met or they, they meet near Silver Spring, the nearby Maryland home of his friend Francis P. Blair, and that they duel with Western rifles. The New Yorker objected that he had never handled a Western rifle and that as the challenged party, he should pick the weapons. Once it became clear that neither party considered himself the challenger, they gained a face-saving means of withdrawing from the code of honor without fighting the duel. When the two next encountered each other in the house, Breckenridge looked his adversary in the eye and said, Cutting, give me a chew of tobacco. The New Yorker drew a plug of tobacco from his pocket cut off a wad for Breckenridge and another for himself, and both returned to their desks, chewing and looking happier. Those who observed the exchange compared it to the American Indians' practice of smoking a peace pipe. Breckenridge supported the Kansas-Nebraska Act in the hope that it would take slavery in the territories out of national politics, but the act had entirely the opposite effect. Public outrage throughout the North caused the Whig Party to collapse, and new anti-slavery parties, the Republican and the American, know-nothing parties, to rise in its wake. When the spread of know-nothing lodges in his district jeopardized his chances of re-election in 1855, Breckinridge declined to run for a third term. He also rejected President Pierce's nomination to serve as minister to Spain and negotiate American annexation of Cuba, despite the Senate's confirmation of his appointment. Citing his wife's poor health and his own precarious finances, Breckinridge returned to Kentucky. Land speculation in the West helped him accumulate a considerable, considerable amount of money during his absence from politics. And there you have it, guys. That kind of leads us right up to his vice presidency. Um, I do want to read some other things here uh, just about uh, Breckenridge, just so uh, you guys can get uh, more of an idea of his early life. So give me a second here. So John Cabell Breckenridge was born at Thornhill, his family's estate near Lexington, Kentucky, on January 16th of 1821. The fourth of six children born to Joseph Cabell Breckenridge and Mary Clay Smith Breckenridge, he was their only son. His mother was the daughter of Samuel Stanhope Smith, who founded Hamden City College in 1775, and granddaughter of John Witherspoon, a signer of the Declaration of Independence. Having previously served as Speaker of the Kentucky House of Representatives, Breckinridge's father had been appointed Kentucky's Secretary of State just prior to his son's birth. In February, one month after Breckinridge's birth, the family moved with Governor John Adair to the governor's mansion in Frankfurt so his father could better attend to his duties as Secretary of State. In August of 1823, an illness referred to as the prevailing fever struck Frankfurt, and Cabell Breckenridge took his children to stay with his mother in Lexington. On his return, both his wife and he fell ill. Cabell Breckenridge died, but she survived. His assets were not enough to pay his debts, and his widow joined the children in Lexington, supported by her mother-in-law. While in Lexington, Breckenridge attended Pis Pisgah, Pisgah Academy in Woodford County. It's P-I-S-G-A-H. Pisgah? Pisgah? His grandmother taught him 
the political philosophies of her late husband, John Breckinridge, who served in the U.S. Senate and as Attorney General under President Thomas Jefferson. As a state legislator, Breckinridge had introduced the Kentucky Resolutions in 1798, which stressed states' rights and endorsed the doctrine of nullification in response to the Alien and Sedition Acts. After an argument between Breckinridge's mother and grandmother in 1832, his mother, his sister Letitia, and he moved to Danville, Kentucky to live with his sister Frances and her husband, who was president of Center College. Breckinridge's uncle, William Breckinridge, was also on the faculty there, prompting him to enroll in November of 1834. Among his schoolmates were Beriah McGoffin, William Burney, Theodore O'Hara, Thomas L. Crydedon, and Jeremiah Boyle. After earning a Bachelor of Arts degree in September of 1838, he spent the following winter as a resident graduate at the College of New Jersey, which is now Princeton University. Returning to Kentucky in mid-1839, he read law with Judge William Owsley. In November of 1840, he enrolled in the second year of the law course at Transylvania University in Lexington, where his instructors included two members of the Kentucky Court of Appeals, George Robertson and Thomas A. Marshall. On February 25th of 1841, he received a Bachelor of Laws degree and was licensed to practice the next day. John Breckinridge remained in Lexington while deciding where to begin practice, borrowing law books from the library of John J. Crediton, Thomas Crediton's father. Deciding that Lexington was overcrowded with lawyers, he moved to Frankfurt, but was unable to find an office. After being spurned by a love interest, former classmate Thomas W. Bullock and he departed for the Iowa Territory on October 10th of 1841, seeking better opportunities. Journeying westward, they considered settling on land Breckenridge had inherited in Jacksonville, Illinois, but they found the bar stocked with able men such as Stephen A. Douglas and Abraham Lincoln. They continued on to Burlington, Iowa, and by the winter of 1842-1843, Breckenridge reported to family members that his firm handled more cases than almost any other in Burlington. Influenced by Bullock and the citizens of Iowa, he identified with the Democratic Party, and by February of 1843, he had been named to the Democratic Committee of Des Moines County. Most of the Kentucky Breckenridges were Whigs, and when he learned of his nephew's party affiliation, William Breckinridge declared, I felt as I would have done if I had heard that my daughter had been dishonored. Breckinridge visited Kentucky in May of 1843. His efforts to mediate between his mother and the Breckinridges extended his visit. And after he contracted influenza, he decided to remain for the summer rather than returning to Iowa's colder climate. While at home, he met Bullock's cousin, Mary Serene Birch, and by September they were engaged. In October, Breckinridge went to Iowa to close out his business, then returned to Kentucky and formed a law partnership with Samuel Bullock, Thomas's cousin. He married on December 12th of 1843 and settled in Georgetown, Kentucky. The couple had six children, Joseph Cabell, Clifton Rhodes, later a congressman from Arkansas, Francis, John Milton, John Witherspoon, and Mary Disha. Gaining confidence in his ability as a lawyer, Breckinridge moved his family back to Lexington in 1845 and formed a partnership with future U.S. Senator James B. Beck. We also know about uh, the Mexican-American War. We had learned about that a little bit. 
Uh, a supporter of the Mexican-American War, Breckenridge sought appointment to the staff of Major General William Orlando Butler, a prominent Kentucky Democrat, but Butler could only offer him an unpaid aid position and advised him to, to decline it. In July of 1847, Breckinridge delivered an address at a mass military funeral in Frankfurt to honor Kentuckians killed in the Battle of Buena Vista. The oration brought Whig Senator Henry Clay of Kentucky, whose son was among the dead, to tears and inspired Theodore O'Hara to write Bivouac of the Dead. Breckinridge again applied for a military commission after William Owsley, the governor of Kentucky, called for two additional regiments on August 31st of 1847. Owsley's advisors encouraged the Whig governor to commission at least one Democrat, and Whig Senator John J. Crittenden supported Breckinridge's application. On September 6th of 1847, Owsley appointed Manlius V. Thompson as colonel, Thomas Crittenden as lieutenant colonel, and Breckinridge as major of the 3rd Kentucky Infantry Regiment. The regiment left Kentucky on November 1st and reached Vera Cruz by November 21st. After a series after a serious epidemic of la vomito, vomito or yellow fever broke out at Vera Cruz, the regiment hurried to Mexico City. Reports indicate that Breckenridge walked all but 2 days on the of the journey, allowing weary soldiers to use his horse. When the 3rd Kentucky reached Mexico City on December 18th, the fighting was almost over. They participated in no combat and remained in the city as an army of occupation until May 30th of 1848. In demand more for his legal expertise than his military training, he was named as assistant counsel for Gideon Johnson Pillow, during a court of inquiry initiated against him by Winfield Scott. Seeking to derail Scott's presidential ambitions, Pillow and his supporters composed and published letters that lauded Pillow, not Scott, for the American victories at Contreras and Churubusco. To hide his involvement, Pillow convinced a subordinate to take credit for the letter he wrote. Breckinridge biographer William C. Davis writes that it was most unlikely that Breckinridge knew the details of Pillow's intrigue. His role in the proceedings was limited to questioning a few witnesses. Records show that Pillow represented himself during the court's proceedings. Returning to Louisville on July 16th, the 3rd Kentucky mustered out on July 21st. During their time in Mexico, over 100 members of the 1,000-man regiment had died of illness. Although he saw no combat, Breckinridge's military service proved an asset to his political prospects in Kentucky. We know uh, about his early political career, pretty much. Breckinridge campaigned for Democratic presidential nominee James K. Polk in the 1844 election. He decided against running for county clerk of Scott County after his law partner complained that he spent too much time in politics. In 1845, some local Democrats encouraged him to seek the 8th District's congressional seat, but he declined, supporting instead Alexander Keith Marshall, the party's unsuccessful nominee. As a private citizen, he opposed the Wilmot Proviso, Proviso that would have banned slavery in the territory acquired in the war with Mexico. In the 1848 presidential election, he backed the unsuccessful Democratic ticket of Lewis Cass and William Butler. He did not vote in the election, defending his decision during a speech in Lexington on September 5th of 1860, Breckinridge explained, but it so happened that there were six or eight gentlemen also accompanying me all of them belonging to the Whig party. And they proposed to me that if I would not return to my own town and vote, they would not. If they would, there would be six or seven votes cast for Taylor and but one cast for Cass. 
I accepted the proposition and we went hunting. And had every man done as well as myself, we should have carried the state by 40,000 majority. Then he was in the Kentucky House of Representatives. We know that. Uh, then he was a U.S. representative. His first term um, was from 1851 to 1853. His second term from 1853 to 1855. Uh, and then, of course, his retirement from the House, uh, where he didn't seek a, a third term. Um, I'm not going to read all of this stuff verbatim, because uh, we kind of did give you an overview of it uh, earlier. So that's kind of his early political career. Um, John Cabell Breckenridge was born in Lexington. His grandfather had served in the U S Senate as, and as an attorney general under president Thomas Jefferson. And his father was a prominent lawyer and state politician. Um, Breckenridge practiced law in Iowa and Kentucky after leaving school, uh, da, 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 da. political career. Uh, he began his political career. John Breckenridge did in 1849 when he won a seat in the Kentucky house of representatives in 1851, he was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives as a Democrat, and he served there until 1855. During this time, Breckinridge established himself as a leading Southern politician known for his eloquent speeches on the House floor. His meteoric rise continued in 1856 when he was elected the 14th Vice President of the United States alongside President James Buchanan. And we're going to get into all of that, of course. Uh, and then, of course, in 1860, he ran for president. You're gonna, we're gonna get into all, to all that in part two. So, there you go, guys. That's kind of the early life and early uh, political rise uh, of John Cabell Breckinridge, our 14th vice president of the United States. And we're gonna get into his vice presidency, his run for president in 1860, and then, of course, his move to the confederacy and him being marked as a traitor so we're going to get into all of that in part two uh thank you so much guys for joining thank you for all the support all the love the comments the questions it's tremendous can't thank you guys enough this has been so much fun love doing this uh and we're going to keep it up of course so no bonus footage right here for part one we'll have a little bit of bonus footage for part two uh, but stay tuned. Tomorrow's part two, a look at the vice presidency, legacy, and then death of John Cabell Breckinridge. Stay tuned. Thanks again, guys. And we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye now.